Hello, wherever you are in the world today, welcome to Beyond the Art in our series, The Stories That Carry Us. I'm your host, Craig Beaumont Flynn, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and the Delaware Tribe of Indians. In each episode, we will discuss with various Native American artists, influencers, art leaders, and everyone in between their experiences, the communities they serve, and the translation and interpretation of the Native American art world today. Well, hi, Evans. Welcome to Beyond the Arts. Nice to meet you and have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm good, glad to be here. So we have with us today Evans Flamin Sr. He's a Rosebud Sioux uh, citizen and uh, artist. And why don't you just give us a little bit of uh, insight into the type of uh, art you create in the mediums? Well, I started, <clears throat> excuse me, I started um, art when, when I've touched my first paintbrush when I was seven years old, and through the years, it just start becoming more and more of a permanent thing with my with my life. And um, currently, <clears throat> excuse me, I do my main thing right now is ledger art and painted robes like buffalo, elk, wolf, deer, bear. But through the years, I developed a diversity of um, like the ceremonial reproductions, like any, anything that uh, my ancestors created a long time ago, that's what I I strive to like master. I figure if I'm gonna make on, a living- on actual, hi- on actual hides? Yes, on actual tan hides. Mm-hmm. And I figured um, early on, as in like 26 years ago, if I'm going to make a living at this, I can't just do one thing. I was realistic <laughs> about that. So I learned everything. So I figured to myself, uh, if I'm at an art show or if I'm selling anything that I do, it has to be, if one person don't want to um, purchase a certain thing, they're looking for a certain thing. Well, chances are I'll have it if I master all of these crafts. So through the years, I pretty much mastered a to Z to uh, for all the um, adornment and the art type texture my um, ancestors did years back and a little long ago. So your cultural heritage plays a huge part in your craft. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I'm very fortunate to um, make a living on that, and at the same time keep my culture alive is my main theme um, in my bio. Uh, that's what I try to stress to people. Um, the um, people who lay their eyes upon my work, that yes, I am um, creating these, but um, I'm keeping my culture alive at the same time. So it's just a win-win, um, making a living at what you do. I mean, what you love to do and, and keeping your culture alive. Um, mm-hmm. There's, it's just, a, it's like the way I look at it like this, it's like, you see, um, I mean, this is just a personal standpoint where a lot of non-natives make a living on Native American um, genre. So I feel not that I have one up on them, but it's just for the fact that I do that, but at the same time, it's my culture. So I feel real good about it. Like if I was doing um, Southwest art or Chinese art or Egyptian art, at the end of the day, there's a little bitty emptiness there thinking, okay, this isn't my culture, but I'm making a living off it. I don't have to... um, I don't have to live that, live that kind of life knowing what I'm doing. I have a lot of non-native artists that I meet at art shows. They come up to me and say, I really like doing Native American um, artwork, but I feel bad that I'm doing it, but I got to make a living at it. And there's some that say, do you think the Native Americans will get mad if I make artwork pertaining to the Native Americans? They say, a lot of people said they will, but I'm, I was there to tell them that, no, um, there isn't. Um, in, in my eyes, they're helping to keep the culture alive, too. Correct. Yeah, and there's so a very I, fine I line. Be, yeah, there's a very fine line of creating the Native American art and being Native American and creating Native American art, especially in a cultural aspect. If you're deriving from your heritage and what came, came before you, it's part of your DNA. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask. Do you feel that it's something relative to your DNA and specific to being a rosebud suit? Or are you kind of collectively bringing together the you know, that's a, Native that's American a really aspect? Good, 
That's a really good question. And I answered that one before. And um, a, a quick little insight on that is different um, people that I know, like in the big cities, they ask me, why don't I move to the big city since I'm so successful at what I do? But I tell them, I mean, th this is just from my heart that if I was to go to a big city, like right now, pack up, move in one week, <clears throat> move my whole studio wherever they want it in the city. If they gave me all them options, like New York or um, Italy or anywhere, I wouldn't have the same kind of um, energy as, as I do right now. Um, I really wouldn't. I, I would still be good at my craft, but it just wouldn't be the same. The, there's gonna be something missing like I know when I look out the um, door to my studio, I, I see the Black Hills and that being such a sacred place um, that and it just when it's instilled in your DNA, like you were talking about, mm -hmm. um, that's it's like a it's like a 911 to have that by me all the time. Like this, the very ground that I live on, a lot of people don't know this, but I met an archaeologist um surveyor or the the people that come down when they build stuff on a reservation they they gotta they gotta um survey the ground if they find any bones or nothing just, just like anywhere they, they gotta stop it so correct they were doing that they were making a road here and one of the gentlemen was native american and he's seen a lot of um really familiar looking hills in their archives that he thought why do they look so familiar and it turns out he came to visit me one day that them very hills are just probably a mile from where I'm sitting and I could see them out my window. And then south of that, which is a mile behind me, was um, some very sacred grounds that someone took in the 1800s with a with the camera, obviously with the camera. Mm -hmm. But I'm right in the trail of that on this very ground. Fantastic. So that that's really deep too. Um, uh, actual... So so it is part of your surroundings of where you are, where you come from that really inspires you and uh, kind of motivates you in creating the art that you do uh, create. Mm -hmm. Because if I so say I moved to a city, another little example, I look at it like if I was to create in a city starting from like next week, my art would be it won't it wouldn't grow i'll still mm -hmm. i'll just rewind all, all the thousands of things that i did in my mind they're just going to be recycled in some way there's going to be nothing really new because of the distraction the um it just i don't know it's just it's just your visual city, perspective yeah. i guess yeah changes yeah exactly like people from new york when they the way they um I'm not saying anything about their art, but you can see it. You can see them in their art. A lot of them, it's um, sure there's a lot of color, but the the mm -hmm. um, off the charts abstract kind of stuff where there's just a lot going on that you can't understand. That's instilled in their mind. Now, say they come out to the prairie where I'm at and try to create. They can't look out the window and see big buildings, hustle and bustle, whatever. It'll it'll put their um art in some kind of stagnant position also it's just a real interesting true. thing true so you said you were seven years old when you picked up your first paintbrush <laughs> what gave you what gave you the inclination that this is what you wanted to do and how to start with that with a paintbrush instead of a pencil or, or chalk or whatever or clay even well it was a real interesting story that one also is um my mother was a um uh, nurse um, and she one day she took me to my um she said I'm gonna, you're gonna go to your uncle's he's gonna babysit you oh I thought oh well, well whatever I don't know what I was thinking I walked in the door and the first thing that I seen and he turned around and his hand was up and he was painting something so here's this if you look at it like a movie there's a woman walking in holding a little boy's hand she's kind of running late here, here he is, and he didn't even say hi or nothing. He's a real shy man. So she shut the door because um, obviously she knew him real well, and I seen him from time to time, but I didn't know he painted. 
And I was sitting there watching him for about three minutes. Didn't know what to do. No toys. <laughs> Just sitting there. And then he turned around and said, do you want to paint? And I said, yeah. And so and he gave me his best, his best um, pieces of material. Um, the, he didn't like do a old canvas to paint over. I mean, he, he treated me like, like, a, like a Cadillac student. And, um, I remember my first painting, it's a, there's a blue background, white teepee, a red moon on the teepee and a little eagle in, in the sky in green grass. And, um, I would give anything to find if that was still exists, if I could, if I could keep it, if I could get it. Cause I run into different pieces I did like 20, 30 years ago from different people, but that very first piece where it went. Yeah. I often think of that, but yeah, it's cause of him. If I didn't get taken to his house that morning to get babysat and all that summer and learning how to do that. And he didn't really teach me either. I just watched. Cause like I said, he's a quiet right. man and I just watched him. I did what he did kind of like a Simon says type thing. And, um, then I picked it up from there and I always had an Eagle in my, um, my drawings. And I still do cause of another deep story of when I was, um, that was just probably, geez, a few months later, it's just real interesting. And I just started telling people this, in 2007, I think, because I thought it was a kind of like an, I used to think it was like really out there, but I, I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to put it on my bio. But when I was, um, sometimes around that time when I was around seven years old, I, we were going to town in a, our little old blue station wagon. I was sitting in the back seat. It was about 180 degrees, super hot. And I was just exaggerating about the heat, but <laughs> staring out the window and because uh, the sun was really beating down on that window and um and I started falling asleep and my sister and my mother was driving I mean obviously my mom was driving my sister and I was in a seat of that um station wagon and then with my face with my head against the window like this it, I mean I could feel it really warm and all of a sudden the temperature changed hindsight so that's going to wake you up if the temperature changes real quick right so right. I woke up I looked at the window and it was dark and it was a middle of the day when what the deal was, it was that Eagle's belly flying right beside the car. And when I realized, I didn't realize what it was at first until it flew away. Then I start picturing, mm -hmm. looking at, Oh, it's a bird. And then I looked at it and, um, it's an Eagle. So it, it didn't just fly away to disappear. Like it could have went up and disappeared or right. just stopped flying. It flew with the car just for a, a, a while. And then when it descended in the sky, it didn't go up back. It went to the left of us. So we were going like this. So I could see it just slowly go till it's gone right be beside us. Like it was flying parallel. And um, from that point on, I don't know what it did to me, but I, I, I really feel that, um, it helped me with my craft. I choose to believe that. Um, it's your spirit animal. And since then, I drew eagles. I drew eagles till six ways till Sunday, and they didn't look like a. I wasn't satisfied with them till I was about sixteen. Mm -hmm. I still hung them up all over my room and stuff, but I wasn't satisfied. I knew they weren't right, but now up to this point in time, I put an eagle in everything I do to pay homage for my gift. Um, and I, like I, I said, it's probably your position. spirit animal. Yeah, exactly. So when you create, are you taking extracts from your cultural heritage or are you trying to reinterpret things that our ancestors created into a more contemporary form? That's another thing um, I get asked in like in and around that kind of question there. But how I answer that is. I use color a lot more and a lot, lot more different shaping, but I don't veer off the path of symbolism. So I just blend them designs and the symbolism into what I do. And, um, and to be quite honest, to make it what I think, because we're all, we're all evolving as human beings, artists, every, everything, the rock, 
the earth, everything's evolving. I tell people, and so is art. So I choose to kind of, kind of jazz, jazz it up a little bit to put it in a more heavy duty spotlight, but with color and different shapes and stuff, but it's still there, whether it's a Buffalo track, wolf track, um, the black Hills pattern, any kind of little insignia or symbolism. I still do on everything I do, even though if it's a little bit contemporary, I don't shy off the path of um, symbolism. And you mentioned connecting to your ancestral heritage and being Rosebud Sioux. So was that a deciding factor or it kind of just geared you instead of saying, well, I'm going to be a contemporary artist. And again, it kind of goes back, I guess, to your location um, and where you're from. So was that definitive in your mind? It's like, I'm going to be a Native American artist and create Native American art instead of doing landscapes or seaside, <laughs> things like that, that it was very defined for you internally, spiritually, and uh, again, part of your DNA? That's a good question. I never got asked that one before. Um, I could <laughs> good. explain that one as, <laughs> as in, um, I watched some, just real quick, I watched some of your other interviews and there were some pretty tough questions you did. And I thought I could, I was like, man, I hope I could hang in there with him. But so far you're taking it easy on me, which is good. But anyway, um, when I first started, um, I did, I was, um, other than like the Eagle and stuff, once I like right along with that, I was really obsessed with drawing monster trucks, cars, um, and believe it or not, seascapes, because um, I wanted to know how they have that that translucent when the wave comes over and the light and not yeah, the way the Chinese right. do it, but just stuff like that. Really, um, shadows, um, rocks. Um, I just dabble in everything, and which is really good because I probably didn't master any of them, but it's like. It was a lot of time and effort, a lot of time and effort, and them come in handy of what I do now with whether it being steady or keen lines or or shading. It just kind of like comes down to them three with all that other stuff I practiced, and it came down to what I do now. And I, I didn't start doing um, like full-blown Native American art until I was um maybe 16. Do you feel there's a continued story you're trying to tell or does the story change with each piece that you create? Always a continued story to tell. Always, 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 story? always. One thing interesting about that. Um, are you familiar to David Gilmore for Pink Floyd? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. No, he had the most, the, I mean, art inspires art and per, a person um, can, a quote could make their day because it'll make so much sense. Now, here's what he said about his music, which was, yeah, I, it's just, if I could give him a high five and thank him for the, these words, I will, other than getting his autograph. But <laughs> he said, someone said, well, where does all these beautiful solos that you do come from? I, do you just practice and practice? I mean, how, I mean, how do you do this? And he said, believe it or not, the solos that I do, the ones that I'm, I'm personally proud of, they came out of nowhere and they kind of came quick. And the ones that I'm not personally proud of, I just, I just, I took months and months to figure them out and um, compose them. But so that's just the same thing as an artist. And I can speak for myself is when I pick up um, a piece of ledger paper, I put it in front of me. I got every color at my disposal, feeling super good for the moment. And I don't dwell on it, but I'll know if that if what I create is is just going to flow or I'm just going to take tid, little tidbits of little things that I was proud of in the past to put to combine them on what I'm working on now. So there's mm -hmm. so many variables of what goes on in a, in a creation piece. Um, it could be a blast from the past kind of memory. Let's revamp this or something just totally new. Um, a new technique, it will arrive or something like that. That's exactly what the deal is. When um, I create something, it's, um, it could flow or I could fight it. Not really a, right, right. not really a creative block, but. Um, so I was going to ask you, do you have an, an actual process 
that you start with, like a sketch or something in your mind that you want to start um, translating oh, yeah. into I, your art form? I think of them months in advance. Um, really? There is so many, and any artist could tell you this, that's real serious about what he, he or she does is, I mean, I like doing a lot of landscaping, spend a lot of time on my yard when I am home and I'm not traveling. But when I'm doing that, um, or anywhere, driving down the road, if I have a little epiphany of an idea, I don't write them down like some people. I just remember them. But there's certain like concepts. Like a snapshot? That, exactly. Like just something like a snapshot, like you said. And, mm -hmm. and it'll it'll help me to, like this one piece, like an example, I'm picturing in shades of brown, a horse running, but real exaggerated with some kind of like a, kind of like an Oscar Hallfield, um, not stealing his, but I, I mean, he's my childhood hero, by the, by the way, something like that with real wavy lines. I still can't nail it down, but I know it's there. That's just one of many that is going to come to life one day. And to answer your question, um, yeah, there's a lot of premeditated thoughts about what I'm going to create. A lot of them. Um, and the grim reality of it all, and I'm not ashamed to say, and I know this sounds kind of um, gruesome, but it's life what we're talking about, is when I'm on my deathbed, there's uh, one of the things that's going to be going through my mind is there's so many things that I didn't do with, with, with what okay. I do. Um, there's no, there's no end to it. It's a, it's a valuable curse because if you look at someone who, and I'm not demeaning anybody in any way, but sometimes I imagine punching a clock, doing what you got to do, coming home, <laughs> spend, spending time with the kids. Before I know it, the kids are grown up. You're still punching a clock. You're coming home. And, and sure, there's other stuff involved in that. A person might go skiing, right. whatever, whatever. But he ain't thinking about skiing all the time. I'm thinking about skiing as an artwork all the time, from the time I get up. And when I go to, when I'm working on a piece like the one I'm working on now, mm -hmm. the last 45 minutes before my eyes shut, I think, what am I going to do to this tomorrow? I can't wait to do it. It's a, such a priority. Nothing else matters. It's, it, it's that deep of a um of a feeling it's just it's real interesting it's, it's kind of like like i said a a valuable curse where you got a one-track mind with, with your art because you make a living that but at the same time you're always trying to top yourself right and right. you want to break ground in with, with within yourself and um there's not there's not a better feeling when you back away from it and you're just super proud of it right do you take risk? Do you think you take risk in your artwork? Um, oh yeah, I I did a true story to that one is the um the gallery that my main representation Prairie Edge in Rapid City. Um I start really getting in when I start doing business with them. I was kind of like stuck in a stagnant position of your typical red, black, yellow, and white colors like everybody else. <laughs> and I, I'm not ashamed to say that them colors start boring me. I mean, you can't mm -hmm. help. I know it's a part of my heritage, but you can't. I mean, we're all evolving, like I said, and I always refer back right. to that line that there's got to be more color in with what I'm doing. So... Right. They were actually kind of standoffish when I start taking things with a lot of color in. Really? And I'm very proud to sit here and say within a year, other artists start following suit of using different <laughs> colors. It was, it's the coolest thing. I, I just knew that. You shook it I up, mean, Evans. <laughs> exactly. Because well, what I tell people, and here's my biggest disclaimer if they want to cry around about it. Mid spring, if you were to walk out your door and you live in a country and look at the ground and walk two miles, every color that I use, you're going to see growing from the earth. You ain't just going to see red, black, yellow, and white when, when you walk right. that two miles. Right. You're going to see every color. 
and why that's that that's what um, the creator gave us. So um, take some colors from the ground and put them in what you create and um, make yourself happy. Do you think um, since your uncle uh, is the one that kind of inspired, mentored you in a, in a way, do you think we're losing focus on the youth and providing them the access to oh, yeah. cultural heritage to great art? Big time off the charts. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you hear like in a big city schools that they took away art. Right. Um, around here, I don't believe there's art, but when I was in like sixth grade, all the way up until probably eighth, it was, that was the, not only the funnest class, but it's like, hmm. it was just the coolest thing. Um, right, they, right. they, they teach people art. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what they got to really realize. And what, what I preach a lot is a person can make a living off art. I personally hate the term struggling artists or starving artists, whatever. <laughs> right. And there probably is such a thing, but that person I hate to sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's always dogging people out for being lazy, but it's up to that person. If you really mm -hmm. channel it, you can make a living off it all year right. long, 365. If you really channel it, um, there's no reason why you can't. Um, if something don't work, then try something else. It's um, bring diversity sure. in, into the picture. Um, the, I mean, your own um, path to success. Exactly. And it's just so um, I don't I don't have time for it now because I'm always on the road. But what I what I plan to do is um, open my studio up the way my uncle invited me into his art world and give pass my knowledge on to someone who's willing to willing to learn it. I'm talking use all, every material that I got, every material. Um, no secondhand stuff. They're going to use what I use. That that's what you call giving back because that's what was um, handed down to me. Um, Correct. But the but the main rule is no drugs and no alcohol. You if you live that life, you're not gonna you're not gonna um, excel. I mean, in especially in art because you got to be a really deep thinker. So you can Correct. be an you can be a reproduction artist. You could draw an eagle or an elephant all day long, just down to a science. But that's all. There's no, nothing else into it. There's no exaggeration into it. There's, I mean, I, I've been around long enough on this earth to know a true artist when I see one, when I see their work. I judged a, um, a art show um, at the Red Cloud Indian School down here. And it was such a really special time because it took me back to, it was first through eighth grade and it took me back when I was a little to see all these drawings, some of them, you know, they were just obviously everybody an artist. So they're scratching stuff down. I was so blown away by some of these art. It was like, it was like seeing my stuff when I was little, it was just, it was unreal. Mm -hmm. um, I could tell who was really thinking, who was really zoning a little kid that I gave um, the best to show to. He was in fourth grade and he, um, he had um, mountains, but he had faces of chiefs in the mountains. That's what mm. it's all about is um, right. exaggeration um, to get your point across in art. And I was pretty impressed. Is there a good small group or art community where you live that supports uh, the art field? Yes, there is. We just, um, it's cool you should ask that. Um, my girlfriend just got... Um, in a position with a nonprofit organization where they put her in charge of the whole entity of it's called white clay maker space. Um, and it's, and it's going to be a really beautiful thing. And, and it's for us to be a part of it is um, a really deep thing because what's going to go on there is they're going to have everything from sewing, carpentry, painting, or any artist through the community want to teach someone their craft, all they got to do is um, 
um, pay like a fee of ten dollars for the, the day, mm -hmm. so that and they they get to go in and learn a, a trade. Um, and I'm gonna step in and do as much as I can with that um, organization as much as possible. Okay. And it's it's gonna be a wonderful thing. Um, they got a like a two million dollar pavilion that's about to go up. Wow. Um, and that's brand new storefronts, and and it's all under that same that same um boundary of what she's running and and I, I'm fortunate enough to have a, have a part of. Mm -hmm. So that's um is that significant for Native Americans or is it for the general public? For anybody. For anybody. Um, oh yeah, it'll be for anybody um to come down like there's they just had a quilting um a quilting class of to learn how to work these like eight thousand dollar sewing machines and stuff and the um the ladies up there the non-natives want to learn how to make star quilts so they're all excited so when they have a star quilt they're going to come down and they're going to um learn how to do that i mean it's just the whole nine yards it's you're never too old to learn a craft i very, mean no matter true. what it is very true you know, it seems like um, Native American art in general has an ebb and flow, you know, where the hot, where the, the cold, where the hot, where the cold, or the it factor. How do you feel Native American art and how it plays importance in society, both in this country and on a global scale in the art world? How does it um, play a role? Mm -hmm. And it's important and, and it's importance. Well, these are all like personal answers because I can't like really speak for anybody else. But here, here's how I feel about that. <clears throat> Excuse me, that that question. Um, art, no matter what anybody would ever tell you, if they won't tell you if it's some type of competition, it's they're lying through their teeth. To what extent, I don't know. But if they're going to show it to the world, then there's mm -hmm. a type, there's a little bit of competitive in them. What they're what, even though they're not mentioning it. So the, the role it has is like, I think is to like, especially if you're native, you're keeping the culture alive. That's what we're, we love to do. And at the same time, it's what we did a long time ago. We adorned everything. What we um, like an umbrella would be beaded. A spoon would be beaded. When these things came upon us, they were just plain, but we threw, we turned them into artwork. And mm -hmm. how many people in the past, I mean, how, how many people when the past thousand years or whatever had all these shiny spoons sitting in their mansions, whatever, all solid sterling, but they're all just shiny. Now, when we got a hold of them, we put our mark on them too. I thought, okay, that obviously the silver meant nothing. So we're going to put beads on them. So, right. <laughs> um, I think it's just, it's kind of like a competitive thing, um, I would think, because as far as importance, I mean, the best way I can answer that is just to, is we're just keeping our culture alive is, is what we're doing. Um, going up against whoever else is trying to do it, whether non-native or any other race. Um, I don't know if that answers yeah. your question. Well, our, our culture is always growing and changing with the time. So just because we had artwork and that was very specific during first contact, you know, us as a tribal nations continue to grow and prosper and we're affected by the surrounding world. So our, our perspective changes, but we're still very, I think, um, drawn and connected to our past. Mm hmm. A lot so of political stuff we, out there. Oh yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> good and bad. On <laughs> uh, with Native Americans, they're incorporating it in a lot of political stuff, which is I have no problem with that. If someone wants to do that, by golly, do what you got to do. Um, and now animation too. There's Native American animation too that's uh, kind of coming to the forefront, which is very interesting and takes a different perspective and view on society and us as a culture. Yeah, there's, I mean, like, um, like the contemporary, uh, what would you say that, that, um, that art, I got a, a dear friend in Minneapolis by the name of Marlena Miles. She's taken 
her computer artwork to another level. Um, and it's where it's something looks 3D. What do you call that again? I wish I knew. It looks like it's floating right in front of you, like when you watch it on a screen. Um, artificial something. Oh, artificial she, intelligence? Something like that. Like where she'll have like a uh, designs all going in a circle and it looks like they're right there. Um, she's incorporating um, the Native American aspect into that and she's... Um, pretty big now with what she does with that line of works and awfully proud of her. And um, like you said, that's like just a lot of different genres in Native American um, with a sprinkle of Native American arc in it. If that, mm -hmm. if that's what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific time of day that you like um, creating that you feel more invigorated? <laughs> A zero below storm, winter storm, where you're where you're, <laughs> you're you're not not only allowed to go outside because you probably freeze up and die, or right. Um, it that's that's the every creation that you see of mine in the ledgers, or they're all from winter storms or very cold day. Mm -hmm. Being inside my studio, where it's nice and warm, and there's just something about that that um you're right <laughs> that warmth <laughs> yeah there's something about like it's so terrible outside but you're in here doing what you love to do it's like a right like a privileged feeling within yourself like i'm i'm real lucky whatever and whatever um but yeah that's that's the deal there um just to be inside where it's nice and warm and my four by four window in front of me just the snow whizzing by just <laughs> Zero below weather. That's what it's all about. The snow doesn't inspire you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, this um, something about it. But this particular time, I mean, snow. I really love winters, but this particular mm -hmm. winter, I'm pretty much fed up with it. I mean, right. I'm I I'm bring on spring, bring it on because usually I'll just really milk out the winter and think, oh no, don't go away. But um, this year I'm 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 ready for spring. Give, give me some green leaves and let the grass come back and let let me hear the hummingbird and I mean the humming the metal arc again. And um, mm -hmm. it's just because like as we speak right now, my pickup is stuck. Um, I was coming in that we live about a quarter mile off the road, and. I was bringing some pallets back about 25, 30 of them in the back of my pickup. And I thought, well, I'm going to go parking around by my workshop. The snow should be shallow enough. I found out real quick that <laughs> it wasn't shallow enough. I couldn't get it out and wow. I got to try to get it out later. Um, I got to get pulled out. That's it's, I buried it pretty good. <laughs> it's just so to go back to your uncle being an influencer, so to speak, are there any artistic influencers now for you? Mm -hmm. Not alive. I mean, I know that sounds really, <laughs> I mean, I know it really Sorry. sounds, it, I sound like Neil deGrasse Tyson now because he thinks his attitude is like, he's just better than everybody else. <laughs> but <clears throat> Honestly, just to really be honest, um, literally not alive. Um, Oscar Howe and Carl Bodmer were the ones for me. Mm -hmm. The most interesting story that I got, one of the interesting stories I got with my artwork. Now picture this nine-year-old boy sitting in a bus looking at a pencil. Remember when they, I don't know if you've seen these pencils, they were like dipped in all kinds of colors and it came back out. They, oh, they yeah. had these in the seventies. Now I was looking at that and I was thinking, then I didn't know Oscar Hall's name, but I seen his art and I said, I wonder if this is where he gets his ideas from because it looked like his background. And I found out who he was and I really enjoyed his work throughout my years and I still do. And as far as I'm concerned, he's the master of brush control and all these years later, two years ago, I was doing an art exhibition at the Journey Museum in Rapid City. 
and who was having an exhibition at the same time? Oscar Hall. So wow. I would like to believe that not that didn't happen for a reason, whatever. I won't get all right. whatever on it. But for my personal thing that I adore his artwork so much that this young boy in a bus would be having an exhibition right beside his, showing his works and showing my work with the doors that are like two feet apart with just a wall separating mm -hmm. us. And I was thinking about that during that exhibition where um, he, it would have been cool if he was alive. I could visit him all day or whatever, but um, in spirit, he was there um, and I was there with him showing off our, well, what we do for a living. That's, I always, that's, and then here's another freaky thing too. I just seen probably three weeks ago on um, when you Google my name, there it shows and i don't know how this happened but there's all kinds of different creations where i'm at where i'm from where i'm going and all that and there's a picture of me drawing and there's a picture right above me how it ended up there i'll never know oscar how drawn in the same position oh, that wow. little thing that little thing just blew me away personally Ser serendipitous i would call that <laughs> exactly yep nice. that, that's what my uncle looks at it like yeah. A wonderful occurrence. Mm -hmm. What are some of your most proud and poignant pieces that you've created so far? Well, there's um, not just because it won best to show at the at an art show, but I, I really I haven't tested myself since then. But there's a piece I call Welcome Home the Warriors. It was 18 by 48. And it was warriors going all the way across the bottom and mm -hmm. old women and children. And in front of them was a whole bunch of horses with the warriors on them. And each warrior was a different was in di different colors like one was being shades of blue one would be in shades of red and their horse mask had the same design as their shield and their face paint everything they were just in my world they were just all color coordinated and perfect that's how i want to see it in my world and that very paint i mean that very drawing that with um my colored pencils was you can look at it either way are they coming home mm -hmm. are they going to war um, in my heart, they were coming home. There's nothing better than coming home. But a lot of people, say, it looks like they're hooting and hollering. They're ready to go to war. But that's just what art does to people. Um, that's, that's probably, yeah, yeah. that's probably that one. Um, I haven't yet beat that one in my mind yet. It's probably because of the scale. Um, and another one was uh, 75th anniversary of the Indian motorcycle in um Rapid City at the Dolphin Art Center, where I got asked to be to that one, which was a really big plus because you got to be juried in a lot of shows. Mm -hmm. And when I sat down, this is just how I'm feel. I'm just being totally honest with you. When I sat down at my studio, in my studio to really start getting down and dirty on his project, I just... Um, the only thing that I have a lot of faith in in this world is my art. The only thing. And I had so much faith that I was going to win that one. I was going into it thinking, I'm going to win this. I, I, I wanted to win it. It's just the way it was for some reason. Um, and, I, and I won it. And it was the only one that sold out of 75 go. paintings. <laughs> so... It just shows... It became like, reality. <laughs> it, exactly. It's just, it's just another way of like um governing your 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 path of success mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you try hard absolutely. enough um absolutely it's in and your plus hands and in your mind yeah that's just some pieces i really uh, attack like that um i'm kind of getting tired of um art shows um, I, I like quotes. You, I babble on about quotes, 
But my personal feeling about art shows is, um, you know who Jesse James, the motorcycle builder is? One of his quotes were, um, they asked him how come he isn't in any shows anymore. And he just bluntly said, and I won't say exactly what he said, but basically he's <laughs> saying, I don't need anybody to tell me that I'm good. I'm not saying I'm super good. I'm just saying in reality right, right. of all the ribbons I got in the past, it was super fun. And it was like a little, I ain't going to lie, like a little greedy, proud moment. Like, Oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but well, you have to have the confidence in yourself. Well, Oh yeah, I do. But it's just, I'm just trying to be like, not to sound so, big headed about it. But in reality, that is the way it is. I don't really need any judges to tell me that I'm good at what I do now. Cause I'm at a point now where, okay, I proved myself, uh, what to the two judges, um, right. whatever. I don't know. It's just, I real anal about stuff like that. Um, and it, and it helps in my work too. It kind of gives you like a stubborn, I'm going to lift more attitude, which try harder. Mm -hmm behind the curtains and when it does come out it's like good lord what was that guy doing all winter kind of thing <laughs> um <clears throat> it's always a competition within yourself there there's no lying about that um but the but is there any pieces that you can think of that you were surprised at the reaction they received no no <laughs> well something like that were like my 2011 or my 207 pieces, 2007 pieces, like when I do art show and I provide prints, mm -hmm. some of my early stuff are really a big hit. And that surprises me, if anything. And like the um, the state capital of South Dakota contacted me and wanted a piece for their permit collection. They picked one that I would have never picked in a million years. Really? Out of all my images, I wish I could have picked it. Um, <laughs> it's like, you pick that one? Um, pick some pick something else or something. I felt like saying that, but it was up to them. But yeah, it, stuff I've done in the past, um, just, I call, there's, if you, if you create different pieces, I, and it kind of goes with diversity. You got um, super Cadillac pieces, you got a Maserati piece, you got a Camaro piece, you got a, a, a 77 Gremlin piece. Them are all, <laughs> them are all affordable. They got but basically beer um pocketbook, champagne pocketbook. It's right, there's right. Di different types that I do. Um because if I did just Cadillac ones the whole time, then I probably won't be won't get them out there as much. Because not everybody can afford something well over three thousand dollars just for a page. Mm -hmm. Um Diversification. <laughs> there was one <clears throat> there's one piece that I just um so that every, here's a question that I can, um, that I've been asked before, like, do you ever become like super attached to something and do, do not want to let it go? Oh, good Lord. There's a piece that I just did for the early 2023 and, um, it just sold. And that one was, I mean, I can't keep them forever, but that was one of the ones that I wish I could have kept. Um, I still going strong though. There's a piece that I kept from 2022. Um, I'm going to put that in my permanent collection. I just made my mind up that I'm going to actually do that, but it's, it's just like, I can always... <laughs> oh, no, about two days oh. ago. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and I thought, you know what? I'm just going to keep it. Um, I kept it this long. Um, it's the only one that didn't get prints made out of it and it's in its framed. So when I, the last few art shows, I told people that, um, there's no prints of it. Um, sometimes one gets away like that, but I'm going to take it apart and make prints of it just in case something happens to it. There you go. There you go. So being a Rosebud Sioux, would you say all of your work is indicative of being a Rosebud Sioux citizen? Or do you like to oh, no. pull from other tribal Native American? Oh, I pull the, the from um, mainly the three affiliated tribes, uh, Mandan, Arikara, and Hidatsa. Um, I start really concentrating on that tribe about five years ago. I knew of them, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. But um, the way them three chiefs are adorn themselves are just off the charts. The dog soldier headdress, which right. comprises of well over 300 magpie tail feathers. Um, the bu- buffalo rib whistles. Um, mm-hmm. The whole quill outfit. Um, my my lineage did, did the same thing, but not as flamboyant as them. It, when I went up there in 2016 up north i walked around in their tribal offices and i didn't see any really in my eyes artwork that did them three chiefs justice so it just amped me up like you wouldn't believe and then when i got back to my studio i mean this is no exaggerating i literally well, once I settle in at home, whatever, well, as soon as I went to my studio, I, I started doing these three chiefs all in a row. And again, I was in it to like, when I was going to present it to their tribe that, mm-hmm. okay, here's what it's all about in, in my heart with your um, beautiful tribe and your lineage. They liked it so much. They said, when can you get here? We want it. Um, so they have it in their wow. permanent collection at the, um, the four bears museum in, in North Dakota. That was a real good accomplishment. Um, and I did them, I do them ever since. Um, I just did a chief four bears on a buffalo robe for them. Um, that one, you had to get a pliers to take my hands off that one when I had to give that, that one away. But that was pretty, <laughs> that was pretty heavy duty. I was really proud of that. So where, yeah, where, so where can our audience uh, see uh, some of your pieces? You'll see all my pieces on um, uh, at Evans Flamon on Instagram. Okay. Um, that's where a lot of people say they, they message me, say, what's your website or um, whatever. And, but I tell them that my old website, um, when I switched to Instagram, long story short, it just it schooled my website. It just buried really? it. It's like, I should have did that a long time ago. And I had friends telling me years back, you got to be on Instagram, but I don't like social media. I'll be, I mean, that Facebook, I, when I, Facebook contaminated everything, just the kind of stuff people talk about. It's not real serious stuff. And so I gonged Instagram for years, mm-hmm. but I wish I could have listened to my friends um, that um, were on it years back. But, but well, yeah, it's been a really, people can find you there. You mentioned you have a rep- representation locally at a gallery. Yeah, and no, on Prairie Edge, Prairie Edge in Rapid City. Um, that's probably the biggest Native American gallery in in, in the world. And you, if you're thinking in little old Rapid City, South Dakota, when you go in there, you'll <clears throat> you'll know what I'm talking about. There's no there's no gallery that big. <clears throat> what makes it even more heavy duty is the ceiling height. I mean, you're talking maybe 40 foot ceilings and artwork all the way to the top. I mean, that's, it's the oh, yeah. scope and the, everything of it is just, now if I had like 15 foot ceilings, it wouldn't feel that, but they're not only going with such high ceilings with people are with Buffalo robes starting from the top and trickling down from wow. shields and war clubs and other sculptures all the way to the ground. I mean, all the way around uh-huh. by 80 by 80. I mean, it, it's deep. <clears throat> Was well, there anything else you wanted to add or tell us about Evans as we mm. begin to wrap this up today? Let's see here. Uh, I could think of probably about 3 million different things when we're unplugged, <laughs> but at the moment, um, but uh, something you want well, to get the word out. Pretty much it. Well, just well, my, wanna, um, go ahead. No, just like as far as like where they could um, see my work primarily is on Instagram. Um, I use it as a portfolio and um, a platform of what I have available. And mm-hmm. I'm going to be making a page where it's just going to be originals because they're kind of mixed up and with it now. I have it okay. marked that it's sold or whatever now, but. There's right. going to be a page where coming soon where there's going to be um, when they say, what do you got for originals and say, well, here's the go to this. And then you'll see everything, what we got going on. 
fantastic. And that's pretty much it for them. Well, Evans, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time and joining us today. It was really interesting to hear your story, and we thoroughly appreciate you being on the show today. Well, I sure appreciate your time, and um, I'm very grateful that you chose me for one of your interviews, and I appreciate it also. Well, thank you, Evans. Have a great day. It was a pleasure. All right. We'll see each other again in the future, partner.